Hi. Hello there. <laughs> Hi, Ramakan. Hello there, George. How are you? Um, we unfortunately only have an hour. <laughs> um, whenever we get together, we have a lot of things to talk about, and we could easily talk for hours. So I'm going to consolidate what could be a free range chicken <laughs> conversation <laughs> and break it down to its studs. So, a little editorializing. Ramakan is one of my favorite artists in the Bay Area. And, uh, you know, I'll say it up front. I was confused when I heard that he was, um, he was the premier emerging artist because I don't think of Ramakan's work uh, or as an artist as emerging. And I understand that all of these phrases are the uh, marketing and internal metrics of how various cultural institutions assess the artists that they interact with. So two seconds after I was like, what? I was like, okay, fine. And so, you know, but Ramakan was telling me the evening of his premiere was that in a lot of ways, this is his debut to a lot of the audiences that unfortunately have not known that he's been here for uh, decades. And so one of the interesting things that I'm going to be speaking about, as it was, as Salam referenced, is that one of the things I love about this show is that it is designed as a retrospective. And so there's a lot of work that even people who are familiar with Ramakan's work will be seeing or have seen for the first time. And so in a lot of ways, as in terms of perception, um, his work is emerging. And so one of the things that I want to start with, um, as I was writing my outline yesterday, the idea of craft, and I, I was telling you a little bit about the conversations or the things I overheard the evening of the premiere. I was really fascinated by how people were responding to your work and I tend to do this, I eavesdrop <laughs> on other people all the time. Um, and so the idea of craft, instead of me saying what it is, can you articulate what that word means to you just to ground the conversation in process? Well, well, thank you for that. You know, I grew up in a family where my parents, and my, particularly the women in my family, my grandmother, my mother, they did craft. They made quilts, or they sewed their own clothes, or they mended their own clothes. So the concept for me when it comes to like craft has always been something that's nurturing, that's been protective, because the quilts, you know, they're pretty warm, and you know who made them, and you know they made them because of you. And they wanted, that, they wanted you to have something they could take to college, or something that they created that expressed their worldview using fabric, quote unquote, craft. Mm -hmm. You know, growing up in the 60s, um, you know, uh, black and queer in the 60s during the Jim Crow, uh, the whole idea that um, finding jobs or finding work was kind of like, you know, for black America was a bit complicated. Mm -hmm. So what can you bring into life that will bring you joy? And the women in my family use fabric. So when I think of craft, I think of beauty. You I think of it as uh, something that's utilitarian, something you can share, something you can create, even something you can transform, you know, that magic, mm -hmm. you know. The room is full of magic. And we, we are the magic, not the objects that we create. And so when I think of craft, I think of all the, of the power, the power of it. And you know, for a long time there, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to be a painter because, you know, that's what, every, that's what you see on TV, that's what you hear in the culture. You've got to either paint and use Western materials, you know, acrylic on canvas. And for a long time, I thought that was what I was going to do. I'm going to be a painter. It didn't work. <laughs> so, you know, so I thought, well, maybe it's time for me to just step back and not be upset about the fact that my work isn't where I want it to be at the time with my paintings. Let's take some time to reflect. No one in my family used oral on canvas to express their worldview. They didn't. They didn't use acrylic, 
either on mat board or whatever it happened to be. They didn't use marble or brass. They used fabric. So I thought, okay, that is authentic to my experience. Only, but it, it took me six months to kind of like go, well, how am I going to be able to uh, translate fabric into something that's, you know, innovative, something you haven't seen before, and let go of, of my hard wiring to want to be a, a painter or an artist on the scale of how the Western world had defined it. And craft was my way out. And then there's another little story, and I have a lot of little stories, and I'm lucky we only have an hour. <laughs> and so, um, when I was growing up, the whole idea is that um, uh, I started drawing at the dining room table. You know, my thing is, you have a dining room table, you have a studio. So, my parents, because I wasn't, you know, I was not athletic. I wasn't playing football, wasn't playing basketball. I wasn't, you know, uh, paying any attention to the young women, young girls who were up and down the, uh, the neighborhood. And I, you know, I was, I was like, I, and to keep them from worrying about, you know, or, keep, or, to, or to hide, I would draw and paint and do my homework on the kitchen table. So my parents would go, well, we see him. He's not, you know, he's not taunting the police. He's doing his homework. I don't know what he's painting. I, mean, I don't, you know, but <laughs> he's right here. And so, so for me, craft is like a, you know, it has been a way for me to, to, de to define who I am on my own terms, using something that's been very authentic, you know, fabric. The ceramics is something very different. I mean, I rely on the skills and talents of the very skilled craftspeople, Tony Marsh particularly, and uh, Christopher Miles, and others to give me their broken shards, what they would usually throw away. And like, you want, you want our shards? Great, we'd be happy to give them to you. you know, and then the remnants, where you know, when I first started, I was using everyday fabrics, like T-shirts and uh, pillowcases. And then I moved from there to these rem to these uh, designer fabrics, which are also remnants. You know, they're they're things that you can't sell in complete bolts of fabric. So they so they are two or what's left over. And and for me, it's how I feel. You know, broken, you're thrown away, sharp and dangerous. So, what would be a concrete metaphor for that abstraction? And ceramics is what. And, and remnants of fabric is what um, is what craft has 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 meant to me. Mm -hmm. That's wonderful. Um, I was telling you also that the evening of the opening, I spoke with uh, a writer. Yes. And she mentioned that she thought you were a um, a complicated person to write about because the conventional idea of craft is that you basically flip the convention over. Yes. And one of the things I was talking with her about is one of the things I love about your work is that you do inverse it by placing yourself into the work that you do. And it's, and it's not just craft in terms of materiality, but you are basically one of the components of what you do, and so of what you make, rather. Can you talk a little bit about how you ended up there? Was that always a part of the work that you were doing? You and, mean and the I'm, photographs? I mean specifically, yes. The, the photographs? The photographs. Ah, OK, so that's good. All right. Um, because, it, just to not to scare you, um, but this is the first time a lot of people are seeing yes. this work alongside, and it expands the idea of your work by watching everything alongside. And one of the truths that we both know is that if you come to your studio, you see all of this. But in terms of how galleries have presented your work before, it's usually, it's usually this, it's that piece, it's that piece, it's that piece. I think your work is recontextualized 
by having your self-portraits in there too. And, and that's basically what I'm trying to marry. Okay, so um, where do I start with that? Okay, so for a long time, you know, um, I was a curator of fine art photography at SFO Museums. I learned a great deal there about photography, the power of the image. And in, and in those days, my body was not included in any of those photographs. But the, but the whole idea of having to limit what you see gives you more, like, how can you be creative within those limitations? That's, that was exciting. Now I don't have those limitations in, in the same way. And so when I, when I bring the, the ceramics to my body, I'm, I'm saying in my mind, I am, you know, I am the vessel, that, just like the vessels I create, because the vessels I create need me to create them. And I don't see a uh, separation from my body necessarily, I mean, I'm thinking metaphorically here, than the, than the work that I create, because I am in every single one. I mean, I don't, I don't have studio assistants, so everything you see, I make. Every, everything that's woven, every zip tie that's, you know, that's yanked with a pair of pliers, I do it, right? So for me, it made, it, made, uh, it was congruent that I photographed myself. And I have my father's collection of photographs. And when he was photographing, he was photographing to document family experiences, family events. Um, and we didn't know about it. You know, I didn't know about it until like the week before he died that he had kept in his strong box all these photographs that go as far back as 1917 with my grandfather in his World War I uniform. And so as a curator, uh, I sit with my father and we would go through the photographs and he would tell me who it is, the year, where, where and I'd write it all down. There's 200 of them or, or so. And I would, I would uh, fact check by talking to other members of my family about who, and they would go, yeah, that's, these are all, they're all pretty much spot on. And then, the, you know, so the continuity of like, you know, my father had a collection of photographs, I'm a curator in uh, photography, and then, and then all of a sudden I had this epiphany where I was uh, here and there was a lecture by, a, and help me with the name, please, a lecture here by a photographer from South Africa Um, Maholi? Oh, Danelli Maholi. Yeah, right? So she was talking about um, her, the content of her images, her, her, her community and social practice. And then she also said, you know, I just start by photographing, just start photographing, you know, things around me, myself and my friends. And here I am thinking, you know, it's, it's taken me this long to go, my goodness, I have, a, I have a phone in my, I have a camera in my pocket. Why can't I just do that? Why can't I just photograph myself? It was an epiphany. And I just thought, you know what, I'm just gonna do this. I'm gonna, I have uh, black silk. I just tacked it to the walls in the studio, you know, found the sculpture or the, or the shard and this, you know. So, you know, a lot of these, except for that one, are selfies. So the one, on the, the one further down, uh, the first one on there, I'm laying on my studio floor with the, with the black silk on the, on, the, on, the, on the floor. I'm on top of it, and I'm holding the phone above me. And I lay the, you know, and I keep, it took a little while, but, it's, it, <laughs> but, it's, but it is definitely striking. So I'm using what my father, you know, I mean, my father had, in my family, I, I have all these photographs, and so what he was documenting, and now I'm able to express my worldview in the same way that my mother, grandmother, was able to express their worldview through fabric. So it's another way for people to engage in the work, you know. And also, I know that there is this, you know, uh, uh, gaze about the body and objects that don't make ref don't make clear reference. It's not a direct A to B. Like you may see the shard on my head and wonder what that is. Like what, it, it's a bit, it's a bit mysterious even to me, and that so it keeps me in the studio. Like I don't know what I'm going to do today, but I know it's going to be about shards, and fabric and photography, or shards and fabric and sculpture. So, I'm gonna 
pull out a word you've said a few times in your answers. Um, shards. <laughs> yes. And so I want to talk a little bit about the meaning of that word, the layered meaning of that word, and what that means to you specifically. Um, I think about, you know, I, I find I'm really drawn to a lot of artists who take the idea of the everyday material and refashion it. There's another artist, a uh, friend of mine, um, Yane Alexis Dominguez, who, uh, whose work remains dazzling to me because he takes throwaway things. He takes things that are discarded and he creates magic out of them. And that's how I think of your work also. What is it that is, a, that is specific to you about this taking the discarded and creating out of it? What, what is the draw to you? And, and also if you can speak to the fact that you take other people's, other artists' debris and refashion it. What do shards mean to me? I will start there. You know, um, the idea of shards came to me in 2016 when I was at uh, Recology um, Residency, which is a, a tremendous residency. So while I was there, um, I was there for four months, and during the first three months, I was just collecting, because it's not from the, what comes out of the dump trucks, it's what people pay to recycle. And you see some phenomenal stuff with the, in their original box, with their original price tag, and I even found, um, what's it called? Uh, what's the name of that type of sculpture? It'll, it'll come to me. So one day I was, I was there, and then the, the director comes to, the, uh, to my studio, and she says, well, you have a great looking uh, thrift store theme going on here, but what's the, I mean, what's the concept for your show? And I thought, whoa, she's right. I don't have any concept for the show. <laughs> And then she just, no, she just smiled and walked away, Deborah Monk, and she, was, and she just kicked me, you know, this sort of word, she was very calm, she was like, you know, and it, it, it hit me so hard because she wasn't upset, she wasn't like, you know, ranting and raving, she just calmly said, this is, three, you've been here three months, and so what's the theme for your show? And I was like, okay, so I've been met, <laughs> and it's about to be a public event, there's about to be a lot of people here. So I thought, okay, so, we got to do a 360 here. So I've been meditating for a long time, and I thought, you know what? How do, how do I feel at, in 2016? I felt marginalized, thrown away, ignored, sharp, and dangerous. So I wrote it all down. But you know, you can't. You can trust your feelings. I'm not sure what else you can trust, but you can certainly trust your feelings. So I wrote them all down, and I went to the a recycling area, which is a huge place, big trucks, everything. You know, moving stuff around. Hard hat, you know, and uh, steel toe shoes, all that. And so I'm wand wandering around there waiting for something, you know, this epiphany to happen. And I didn't, I was thinking, this is not working until I heard the crash of broken glass and ceramics. And something said, go over there. And at that age, at, at that, I think I was in my what, 56 maybe. And I thought, you know what, maybe I should pay attention to my intuition, you know? And so I walked over there, and all I saw were broken ceramics, broken glass, teapots, and cups, and plates. And I was like, I was crying misty for them. I was getting all, oh, you know, all teary-eyed over, and I thought, oh, that's what it's about. That's what, that's how I'm feeling. And if I'm feeling that at 20, in 2016, I didn't drop out of the sky. Other people are feeling the same thing too. So why not use broken ceramics as the metaphor for you know uh, being thrown away, being ignored, uh, being frightened, being you know uh, sharp and dangerous, all that. Let that. This, the more and more that I use them, the more the message unconsciously becomes clear. And then I used to, I still do. I used to uh, uh, put them in. Uh, frames with you know and I would put I would just stuff all these broken ceramics in these frames until one day I thought one day that I was I was having a crochet jam at Recology and I had all this fabric it was just laying there and then I started wrapping the fabric 
the strips of fabric around the ceramics. And then the first piece that I created, I, it was uh, shown at, at Kala, at one of their auctions. And uh, Patricia Suito saw it, who's the dealer, my, my art dealer, who's now in LA. She saw it and bought it and asked me if I had any more. Well, you know, I didn't, but I, but I, I, said, I said, you know, um, when would you like to visit? I, I'll probably need a couple of weeks, you know, other things here. <laughs> I need to make some more. I need to make some more, yes. yes. And so that's how it started, was the whole idea of being the authenticity of like saying, well, yeah, this is something that people don't use as art, but it still has meaning and how can I, you know, don't, don't question it. Just do it. And, um, and the idea of helping, you know, the story is that, so um, I was using domestic everyday fabric, cups and bowls. And uh, Pat Suito, her gallery, she has ceramicists, you know, you know, and they have, you know, one of a kind objects, even if they're broken. And she said, you know what, how about crocheting around some of these broken ceramics that my friends are happy to give to you? And, you know, and they are one of a kind, you'll never see them anywhere else, and it'd be fun, so, and they'd be beautiful. So if, they're gonna, if, they're, if they are willing to donate or give them to you, you know, see what happens. And that's how that got started. So it's a, so it's a, it's a, it's a you know, like for example, uh, I don't weave the clothes that I'm wearing, nor do I sew them. Very few people can make their own clothes. So we rely on others and the skills and talents of mostly black and brown women around the world to make the clothes that we're wearing. And I also rely on the skills and talents of tremendous ceramicists who allow me to incorporate their work into my creative vision. It's a collaboration. And that to me, it also pushes the idea of what ceramics is. What, what, what is, not ceramics, but what is craft? What is fine art? What is sculpture? I mean, what is the black body? What, you know, so those, those you know, thinking outside of, of what I've been taught to believe and just letting it go. Okay, so I've been taught that all my life. So what? What do I think? And who am I outside of my indoctrinization in this culture? So I actually have two questions for you <laughs> out of what you just said. And I'm gonna ask them both, but you can answer them separately. Um, well, the first question I'm gonna ask you is where did the sharp and dangerousness come from. So we'll get to that for a second. We'll get to that in a second. But I, you know, one of the, as an, as an artist, one of the things that irritates me about, mm -hmm. the, about the way that we talk about art is that we often are, ask questions that we don't answer. And there's always just this like question that hangs in the air. And the idea is that the viewer is supposed to um, just walk away with their own impressions. And I fundamentally disagree with that. I think artists are actually responsible for answering some of those questions and being clear about it. And people can still have their own perspectives. Um, and so my question for you is, do you think your art answers those questions that you asked at the end? What is the black body? What is craft? Do you think that the artist has a responsibility to answer those, to, to supposition those questions and then answer them directly? Or do you, do you think that it should be more of an open-endedness? Let me take a, a deep breath on that one. <laughs> <laughs> Maybe two deep breaths. <laughs> OK, so. Um, I don't go into the, to, uh, I don't go in with an answer to the questions. You know, I, I, I know, so what I create and what I make is a response to the question, okay? It's not, it's not necessarily an answer to it. It's just how I'm able to say, well, this is how, if I was a poet, I would, I would answer it using poetry, or I would answer it in an essay writer or a novel, whatever, right? But as a, a sculptor, a visual artist, um, I, I have all those questions, you know, what is the black body? 
you know, the, the gaze of the, the black gaze, the white gaze, the, the, the ceramics, you know, is it, is it craft, is it fine art, is it sculpture, is it weaving? I have all that. Is my grandmother here with me? Is my mother, is my, my you know, they won't like that. Don't, you know, I have all that is there with me. All of it, right? And the more, the more it screams at me, I know I'm doing something right. Like, you know, you couldn't do it like that. I go, okay, I hear that. And I, and I do it anyway, right? Because that was what I was supposed to do that's safe, right? That's safe because, quote, unquote, they won't like it or they won't appreciate it. You know, so, I, so a long time ago, I was, I was taking uh, Brazil nuts and I was stamping them with their horrible racial epithet. And I would, I would go to the uh, print store and I'd order a stamp, right? Two stamps. And I would, you know, and I'd put them in uh, jars. And so I brought some home for my mother. And she goes, these are great, right? They're beautiful. They're brown and orange, you know, with the, with the, with the black lettering on it. And she'd get close and she'd go, you know, these are just, how many, do, how, many, you know, how many do you want? She had them on a shelf, or whatever. And then I said, I said, Mom, I want to put these in museums. She goes, oh, no. Oh, they won't like that. And I thought, now, isn't that interesting? They won't like that. But it's, the, but, it's, but it's what I've heard, you know, I don't remember ever hearing Brazil nuts when I was growing up. And so, I, so, I, so the whole idea of answering the question is more like, you know, giving an expression. How do I, I'm not sure there is an answer that can be, you know, uh, pointed to and say this is it. It's a, it's a bit more ethereal than that. Ethereal? That's the word. I, I can make up a few more while I'm sitting here and watch. <laughs> <laughs> um, and that, and that kind of gets me excited. I like, I, also, I was talking to my mother a long time ago, and she was talking about that in, in the, in the uh, masonry, in the, in the uh, black masons, uh, there's an Eastern star, which is the women's equivalent or counter, counterpart to that. And so my father at one time was the grand worthy patron. So he would be at the, at the meetings of the Eastern star, part of it, right? And so I go, I go, hey, mom, what would happen if you ladies, all in your 60s, 70s, and 80s, decided to have a meeting and dad wasn't there? She said, it wouldn't be real. And what's it to you anyway? I was like, oh, oh okay. <laughs> uh, okay, so, right? But you see, you see the whole, you see, you know, that that level of where to back off, where to, you know, that to me is an invitation to engage. Where to back off? Or, you know, uh, particularly if it's something that's as political as art. Art is everything. Artists, art, and artists are always political. I don't care what you use to make your work with. But there is this, but it's, we are ingrained that there is a, we have to stop. We, have, we can't go but so far. Even if it's harmless, we can't go but so far. Um, like you say, you know, artists ask questions and they never, get, they never go to the answer, they never get the answer. So how close did I? <laughs> you did, you, I rambling? You did a fantastic job. Oh, thank you. <laughs> um, one of the things that you said, um, it's funny, every answer, like, that's a question. Good. Um, that you said that art is political. Mm, yes. Is something that I don't think most artists know. And it usually comes down to the construct of race. Black artists know that our work is political yes. because our work is not given any other bandwidth yes. than that. So that's the starting point of our understanding of our work. Our work is always politicized. Yes. Um, there are a lot of art, white artists I know that don't think that art is political because they have the luxury to think that their work is not political. But um, all art is political, yes. uh, whether you know it or not. Um, and so did you always have an understanding of that? Uh, no, I always had an understanding that that there was a, that there was boundaries, and I, I knew that I can get people's attention by pushing those boundaries. 
And uh, so if you, can, if you can get people's attention by pushing a boundary uh, in a drawing or in a, any, any, any medium, which, you know, poetry or play, whatever, then that's power. Because that's the first thing that people, that uh, governments want to shut down is uh, that whole uh, uh, more than one way of perceiving what you're looking at. If you can't control it, and, and other people bring their own ideas and concepts to it, and it's just as valid as the person who makes it, then that, you know, you, you, know, you, you can't control the message, right? And, you, and that's, a, that's a problem for any government. That makes it political. There are other ways it could be political, mm -hmm. you know? Or just the fact that, it, that the work isn't being shown in certain places, even though it's not being shown, the work that's left out means that that work is political. What is not being shown is probably, it's, you know, it's probably pretty interesting what is not being shown uh, and for what reasons and why to maintain the narrative or story that has been uh, socially and culturally accepted. Yes. Yes. Um, so I want to go back to an earlier question. I don't want to leave a hanging chad. <laughs> <laughs> or a hanging shard. <laughs> or hanging shard. <laughs> um, so where did the sharp and dangerous part of you begin in terms of your origin story? Like what was the, and it's, my question is less about where do you come from? It's more what in your origin story led to you being the artist that you are? What were the original shards that oh. you pulled together? Oh, oh, oh. Well, you know what? That's going, how much time do you have? But <laughs> I'll break it down. I'll break it down. So um, I think one of the biggest things, biggest uh, turning points about my interior uh, psychology as an artist mm -hmm. is when I decided to define art on my own terms. You know, when I decided that, okay, I, I need to dig deep inside who I am and find out what is unique to me that no one else can create. Other people can work with shards and fabric. Let them. I hope they do. But if you want my goodies, you got to come to me. Right? You know, and how do I get there? And for me, the med my meditation practice has helped me be able to reflect and just slow things down so I have an opportunity to reflect, uh, to act and not react, right? You know, react. Um, and then I, can, then I can hear all the messages, all the languages, all the stuff that's inside my head and go, you know what, that ain't me, that's my mother. That ain't me, that's my dad. That ain't me, that's, you know, that's the Jeffersons. You know, that ain't me, you know. <laughs> Moving on up. That, you know, that, you know, that ain't me, that's Bonanza. You know, that, you know right? all that and more. And that ain't me, that's the church. And that, you know, that, right? So who am I in all of that? Because I, cause I, you have to dig through it. Like, you know, we're kept too busy. we kept too busy working, too busy shopping, too busy eating, too busy doing other things to be able to have the time to go, all the noise, and through all the noise, somewhere below that noise is who I am. And that hasn't been seen, because I feel as though that if I'm always pleasing others, you know, pleasing my parents so we can survive, <laughs> you know, they're, they're pretty big when you're young, right? They're, um, then, then pleasing the police, and pleasing the governor, and pleasing the priest, the minister, pleasing, 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 right? And if I keep pleasing, you know, even my artwork, I mean, am I making this stuff to please an audience? Or am I genuinely want to create from what, from to please me and my worldview? And does that have value? It's taken me a long time to say, yeah, it has value. It doesn't the audience will bring their own worldview, their own uh, experience to whatever they see, and that is glorious. But Trying to please the audience, uh, as my mother would say, takes the J out of joy. 
Took me a couple of seconds. <laughs> I got it. I got it. <laughs> you know, um, and it's been a struggle. So my inter- my internal world has been like you know letting go of how to, uh, you know, uh, define myself on other people's terms as an artist, as a as a human being, all these things. It's taken a while, but I I think it's well worth it. Yeah. So I was thinking the other day. You know, I have been in conversation with you for so long, it feels like. It feels like we've known each other a really long time. But the truth is, I have to come clean. <laughs> we've only known each other for a little over a year. And that's how kind of intimate and intensive our conversations, especially around art, have been. Like, we basically started immediately and have had really in-depth conversations about uh, the landscape, certainly the local landscape. And I'm going to come back to a question about your perception of the Bay Area, um, which is an eternal, it, eternally tedious, ongoing conversation. <laughs> but my, we met each other on a panel. I was a moderator at a De Young event, and Ramakan was one of the... Um, was one of the panelists, and he really brought the house down a few times. And I remember, and, and like he arrived right as the event was beginning, and he left right after. And everyone was like, "Was he even there?" It was, it was like Batman. He was just gone, and he really left an impression um, on the audience and the other. Uh, panelists, and one of the things that really struck me in that conversation was your voice, just how clear you were in representing, and the conversation, it was in, in conjunction with the Patrick Kelly exhibition, and so we we're all talking about race and art and fashion, and I was really struck there in that conversation about how clear you were about a lot of things, and so my question is, where did that come from? Has that always been there? Or is that something that developed and evolved with, along with the work that you make? Uh, no, it has not. No, it has not. Um, I think a lot of the, that um, clear focus, that uh, confidence about race and gender and all that, has come out of my over 30 years of working as a, an artist. You know, the whole idea of, of uh, pushing ideas around, you know, working in museums. I mean, I, I, you know, I'm, museums have a, museums and art centers have, a, and art galleries have a lot of ideas that they push around all the time. And so I first started at the uh, African American Historical Society at Fort Mason, right? And I'm not sure if it's still there. And then I moved from there to the Richmond Art Center, where I was there for two, two, maybe two or three years. And then there I moved to the uh, 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 San Francisco, the SFO Museums. Although it was the, the name was at the time I was there, the name was different, but nonetheless, um, starting as a preparator and then luckily being promoted off crew into curatorial. And we were pushing ideas around writing labels for fine art photography and other, and other exhibitions for, I was there for 20 years, um, and I think I was a, a curator for maybe 16 or 15 or, or those years. Um, and as, so being able to do, and you only had very little space to write, right? So the whole idea of clarifying your thoughts, clarifying your ideas for an audience, with a huge audience, really helped me, you know, ground myself, along with the meditation, along with my own writing, my own poetry, my own ideas, helped me be able to, to see in what ways you can use language to clearly express your ideas, um, particularly in a, in, a, in, a, in, a, in a place where people see what you write as the authority, you know, and they, they may not read what you write, but they certainly will see what's on the walls. Um, and that may draw them to, to what you write or vice versa. So I know as a, as a curator who, at the time, who would decide 
with you know in community with you know in collaboration with the leadership at the museum what people would see and so we would go back and forth I mean what I, what I was writing and I'm, I'm sure it's probably still the same case people would I, I would share what I was writing and get people's you know call it my colleagues views on what they were seeing on what they were reading so that we can so that it, to help clarify and, and uh, grammatical and all that um, and I think being in the art world and being, you know, as an arts administrator, as a curator, um, I've also written poetry and short stories, and some of them have, not many, but some have been published, uh, that's helped me be able to, you know, wrestle my demons to the ground so that I can create something or express something quite powerful that is uh, new and compelling because most people don't have the time to do it. I'm very lucky to have the time to do it. Mm -hmm. um, so I want to ask one more question before we go on to the installation, of which I'll explain to you guys what that means. Um, Elizabeth, how much time do we have before I, bring it, I pass it over to the audience? Great, perfect, thank you. Um, so let's talk about the Bay Area for a second. <laughs> let's, let's, Is that where okay. We are? Is that where we are? Okay, I was All like, right. okay, let me, let me get comfortable. Um, <laughs> okay, so this conversation, I've lived in this San Francisco for 23 years now, and so I've watched lots of ebbs and flows and patterns, and the city is this, and the city is that, and that, blah, 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 blah. And it always seems to be polarities of the same conversation. Either the city is a mecca for artists or it's the worst place for <laughs> artists. And it's both of those are untrue. Mm. Um, and they just, it turns into white noise after a while. Mm. But that's me. <laughs> what do you think of what this place is to the artists who are here? Um, what is this place to you? What has it done and what has it not done for you? Well, I moved here from Tokyo in 91, I believe. I've been here a long time. Uh, on my way to LA, and I haven't gotten there yet. <laughs> Maybe there's a little time. Maybe I'll get lucky. Um, I, uh, I feel as though that San Francisco has been very good to me. Um, in many ways. I mean, I've been very creative here. Uh, it's home in many ways. I spent more time here than I did, than I have in the small town that I grew up. I couldn't be who I needed to become and stay in that small town. And San Francisco has been a way, or has been an inviting a, a, with, with the cultural, gay and lesbian, transgender, all the, all the, all the things that would not be possible in a small town in North Carolina. It would just be too, that to conform would be overwhelming. I wouldn't, I, it would break me. I could not do it. And I knew that if I didn't do it, um, I couldn't stay there. I'd have to conform. That's why I went to Japan. How far can I, how far away could I go? Right? So I got my master's in divinity and went to Japan, stayed there five years. But I digress. I love how you're just breezing over the divinity school part. <laughs> so. I'm, I'm going to represent the audience. I already know this story, but I'm going to represent the audience. And he went to divinity school. Um, San Francisco. Uh, <laughs> he's, keep, he's keeping it. He's not, he's not going to pick it up. He's not going to pick it up. It's a, it's, a, it's a good story, Yeah, though. but I want to stay, stay on point. Yes, yes, okay, right. thank I'll you. I'll stay on point. But okay. it's a good story. <laughs> so, um, San Francisco has to change. I mean, everything has to change. I look in the mirror, and I know that things are changing. So if I'm changing, San Francisco has to change. I, whether I like the changes or not, it's, nowhere, it's not nowhere near as important as who am I? Let the city change, let New York change, Berlin, wherever, wherever you want to, it's gonna, it's gonna change. But who am I in the change? Um, 
do I like what is changing? Do I want to do, you know, how can I be happy where I am? Because if I'm going to go somewhere else, and if I'm unhappy, I will take that unhappiness to wherever I go. So I can, so I can stay here and say, well, this needs to be done, that so-and-so isn't doing this, right? And, be, and then say, I'm going to go somewhere else and be, you know, angry and bitter and unhappy, pack my bags and be angry and bitter and happy somewhere else in the world. That doesn't make sense to me. So, so, you know, so if, where do I want to jump in and say, well, where can I do something about what's, about the city that I find needs to be changed? What am I, what's my, as a citizen here, what's my role in doing that? How can I, you know, um, manifest what I want to have in the world instead of complaining about what I want to have? This is my, this is what, other people have different ways of navigating that situation. This is mine. And, you know, I've come to the realization that the city has to change or it will, or it dies. It has to change. Uh, whether I like those changes, you know, that, you know, the, a better question is how do I want to respond to those changes? That's a better question because they are definitely going to change. And my thing to respond is as calm as possible, you know, and if I, you know, if it's, if it's something that, you know, um, in a way that, that's positive. Like I, I applied to be on the reparations uh, committee here. Uh, I applied, I wrote, the, you know, I wrote the letter and all this stuff, and I was at the meeting, I was online, right? And I thought I was online, but I wasn't. So when they called my name, I didn't hear it. <laughs> right? So they, they put, but, but still, there I am, right? And then I got, I got this email from one of the uh, um, supervisor's assistants, or they have their, their aide, mm -hmm. And they said, well, we have a whole list. There's a whole list of other committees you can be on. I thought, no, no that's good. Just pick another one. Um, so uh, what, what was the, other, what was the other, other question about the city? Uh, was it done for me or what? what? Yes, what, it, what has it done for you and what has it not done? Oh, well, what it, okay, what it has done, I may mean, have mentioned before, is it allowed me to become who I need to be period, full stop here. Now, I wouldn't know what that meant. What, I, I can't even speculate what that would be like in New York or LA or Berlin or wherever else. Doesn't matter. This city allowed it to happen. You know, you know my, I mean, at, even at the airport, I, I have this community art project called Crochet Jam, and, and there's a safety, health, and wellness department. The name may have changed now, I don't know. But they, the, the leadership there allowed me to bring my, uh, meditative project to the employees at the museum, at the, at, at the airport, you know, the whole, the whole, every department. So the whole idea of affirming, you know, the, you know, and then, you know, uh, at the Richmond Art Center, I had ideas there that they allowed me to, to, to explore, you know, the whole idea of not being shut down. Now, of course, not every idea was approved. Some of them were like, Maybe not here, <laughs> and I, that's not going to happen here. But, uh, but I think that San Francisco has uh, provided a space for me to grow and to become who I need to be. I don't think that I would be sitting in this room talking to you and have the privilege of having this audience here and having an exhibition here, and other venues that I've that, that I've had since I, if I if I didn't have the opportunity to to, to value my ideas and move them forward. I don't think it would have happened. So, and it'd be, it'd be less likely in a small town in the middle of nowhere in North Carolina because what I was doing in those, what I was doing, um, it, you know, would would upset people in a way that would make them question their own decisions, and that's really threatening. You know, they they they've invested their whole life into this. You know, and you're, you know, for example, you know. A brief story about Divinity School. Okay, so a brief story. So when I was in Divinity School, we had these summer internships where you would go and be the minister in training. And so one summer I was minister in training, which is small, right? And the, the um, supervising pastor, he wanted to go on vacation. So he let me run the church, right, for, the, for that Sunday service. And I was talking about, you know, Adam and Eve and how Adam and Eve as we were learning in seminary, was a, a myth to, ex, to explain, no, a story to explain a mystery, that there was no, 
It wasn't actually an Adam and an Eve. It was a whole idea about right, a story about um, how we how humans came to be. How we right. I thought the I thought the sermon was I thought I was pretty happy about it. Right. Um, and then I get a call from the bishop, and I thought, <laughs> and then I thought that I thought the bishop was going to like say, well, you know, how you doing at the, you know, your internship, and you know, so I get all dressed up and I go to the, you know, this is the bishop or the superintendent, uh, I can't remember which, and this is this is the south, and so everything is very polite, very, very polite. He, he didn't call me reverend because I wasn't ordained. He, you go, know, and uh, he said. I, you know, I've heard you're doing some great things at your internship, you know, and your, uh, you know, and then, uh, and I'm thinking, you know, you've heard what things, what great things, <laughs> right? Um, and then he mentioned the whole idea that, you know, um, on last Sunday, the, your, your discussion, your sermon, uh, there are some things in, that you learn in seminary need to stay in seminary. And you don't want to upset Mrs. Jones or Mrs. Taylor or Mrs. Rogers, Mrs. Rogers. Now, do you? And I thought, no. <laughs> uh, I'm like, and I was thinking, how was I upsetting them by telling by because they had invested their whole life and their finance and whole and their their future on this planet and beyond in a story where Adam and Eve were a literal interpretation of the Bible. And here I was thinking, well, I mean, you know, critical thinking skills, right? Why not, you know, why not? <laughs> isn't that my job? You know, it's, it's my, it was my, it's what I got, that's how I earned my degree for my, my, for my critical thinking skills, but it wasn't what you were supposed to do for the parishioners. And I thought, well, wow, my job is just to maintain their ignorance, and I thought, that's, that's very sobering as a seminarian, you know. So if I stay, this is what I'll be doing. So I thought, you know what? And maybe I should take my drawings and paintings to another, con to another continent, and I did. Maintaining their ignorance. So before we turn this over um, to you guys to ask your questions, I'm sure you have a few, um, one of the beauties of having beautiful things, of having one of the beautiful aspects of having this conversation here is that we get to be amongst the work. And I, <clears throat> I see it as a wasted opportunity for us to not actually spend some time talking about the work itself, and Ramakan in particular. And so what I thought, I spoke with him about this, the idea of selecting one piece and him dissecting the process, basically what is inside <laughs> of each of these pieces. And so we're not gonna do that for everything because we will be here for several beautiful hours. I'm going to select this piece here, and, and he and I had not actually decided which of them, um, but this is the piece that keeps calling out to me. And one of the things I was asking um, him the other day is, I want to understand the interiority of it, what is on the inside, not just what is on the outside. So if you can talk us through a little bit about what the materials are, what your process for making it is, and what is on the inside? Like, you know, for instance, I was wondering, are these pieces hollow on the inside? Are they saturated and dense? What is on the inside? Since we can't see them, what is, what is underneath what we can see on the surface of these crafted pieces? Okay, so I'll discuss that, and then we'll go to this. Sure. Okay, so Great. what's on the inside, right? Um, What's on the inside is more of just more and more of what you see on the outside. So they're pretty heavy. They're like 35, 40 pounds. They're pretty heavy. And so my biggest um, 
uh, I won't call it a problem, I call it a situation. My biggest situation is making sure that it can stand. So the base, um, I don't worry about what, the, what it's gonna look like because it's, these are all my colors, these are all my, you know, all my fabric, I choose everything that's in it, right? I don't have to worry about what it looks like. I have to make sure that the base, given the physics of gravity and the weight that I put on top of it, will support it. So how do I do that? So I have the shards all around me, and I pick one, and I pick, I pick two, and I try, to, I try to get them before I attach them to have three points or four points on the table. And then once I'm able to do that, then I put fabric in between the ceramics so that there's not ceramic rubbing against ceramic. And then I hog tie that base like you would not believe, right? right? I, you know, I uh, kung fu that like you would not believe. It's always, it's rope, uh, uh, crocheted or plaited fabric, it's zip ties, and then on the inside so that the ceramics will main, you know, will, will keep its shape, I, I stress it so that, it's, so that the fabric around it, because the ceramics is, has grooves and it's broken and has grooves, the fabric will lay inside those grooves and grab it like, you know, like, a, like a kung fu grip kind of thing, right, and hold it there. And then I place more stuff, more fabric on top of that and then another ceramics and I go all the way around. So I'm walking around it as I'm creating it. So it's more fabric. It's more, so it's all ceramics, fabric, um, chachkas, you know, this and that kind of things, right? And zip ties and burlaps because I, I, I go to the coffee store and they have all this, all these burlap bags. And they go, well, if you want them, we're happy to give them to you. And I, un I, I take them apart and I unravel them. And that's what you see on, the, on, the, on this side toward the audience. It's, that's, that's burlap. So that's what's inside. It's, most of it is on the inside, really. A lot of it you don't see because it's covered. And now for this piece, right? Yes, which is a, that I wanted that point to be clear, is that there, it's not just on the inside. It, there, there is materiality on the inside of yes. all of these pieces. And for the, for the piece behind me, these are all segments. So they're, they're, they're rectangular segments. So I have maybe, we'll just guess, maybe 10 to 12 individual segments, right? So the hooks that are holding it, the stainless steel hooks that are holding it, it's only holding the 10 pounds of fabric for one segment. So nothing is holding, if there's 12 pieces, you know, uh, the entire weight, which, is, which would mean if I, had, if, I, if I attached all 12 and whatever that would, whatever that would add up to be, 100 pounds or 120 pounds, whatever, would need, would need uh, more than hooks to hold it, maybe a small armature. But if they're individual uh, squares or rectangles, I can attach them and then rearrange them at the site. So I don't quite know what's gonna look like until I get it at the site, all right? So, so inside this is all fabric that I crocheted, unraveled, and cut, and then, and then I attach the zip ties and leather bobbles or bulbs or balloons. <laughs> so the, the, the purple, the lavender, the green, the purple, the lavender, the green are all leather and the rest is all fabric, silks and satins and there's a chain and zip ties. The, the zip ties for me are, are tie into the whole idea of restraint. You know, we, that's how I feel. You know, we, we emotionally, psychologically, given the environmental, political, and social situations in which we find ourselves, many of us, if not majority of us, feel constrained. Uh, that's why in some of these you may find small locks or other, or uh, a friend of mine taught me how to, uh, how to, how to tie binding knots. You know, so that so, the whole idea that you we emotionally we we don't know what to do, we don't know where to go, we just keep working and keep paying our bills. You know, <laughs> we don't know what's gonna, you know. Um, so I want to be not. I didn't want to talk about it so much. How can I get people to reference how they're feeling? You know, it's it's tough to to acknowledge your emotions. 
we're not, we're not supposed to do that. We're, we're not, it's difficult to say, I feel, or what, and people actually talk about, because we, we, when we say, hello, how are you? No one really answers that question, it's hello, how are you? So we have a whole culture uh, focused around not expressing your, sense, uh, your emotions or your feelings. You're, you're, how, how are you is just to acknowledge that I see you. Oh, I see you, hi, how are you, hi, how are you, or how do you do, how do you do, but never emotions. So um, I, wanted, I want to communicate to the unconscious. So I have put these zip ties, a lot of them, which are reference to restraint, 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 particularly when it could be associated with the police or bondage or any other reference that in the same category. Uh, and elements that don't usually go together. You don't usually think of, of a wall hanging with zip ties. <laughs> but, it, but it matches my feeling. How I, so I figured it, to, be, to be authentic, if you can find materials that speak directly to your emotions, use them. Because I'm not, I didn't drop out of the sky, although I'm sure some people might think, well, you know, you know the aliens have, have replaced Ramakan with somebody else, right? Because um, we're more alike than otherwise. Perfect segue to all of you. Um, are there, how much more time do we have? Okay, great. Um, so I have a couple more questions, but I'm gonna turn it over to you uh, until someone doesn't have a question anymore. Um, feel free to raise your hand. Susan. So if this piece is arranged on site, do you consider it living? Because you can continue would you install it someplace else in a different way? Would you add to it? Is it done? That's, a, that's powerful. That's great. Okay, so it's done for this installation, right? Because the registrar, he or she would not like it if I, you know what? I want to add to that piece. <laughs> <laughs> you know, like in the, it changes the dimensions. Does it change the value? Because it, it's been insured for a certain value you've added on the total. I know how I know that that's a nightmare. Although I do want to change it, <laughs> right, right. But but I'm but I'm not in my studio. If I was in my studio, there wouldn't be a problem, right. But I want to respect the, you know the, the curator's vision on, on on it so that we can you know so I don't. But is it but is it done? You no, know, that's that's a great question because in in, the, in Western art, it's done when it's you know, and then no one else can not, nothing else happens to it. I, th you know, I think it's kind of, you know, I, I used to have, the, or still in some of the crochet jam events where I would have uh, people make, make their crochet piece, right? And then they would add it to the wall. And so the whole run of the month for the exhibition, people could come in, crochet something they like, and add it to the piece, right? Because it's not my work. I mean, I facilitate the, or the event, but I didn't create it. The community creates it, they decide how it looks. And that's beautiful, because it, it's not controlling, you know, it's not saying, you know, whereas, whereas in a museum, the whole, the whole uh, construct is different. And I have to respect that if I want to show in museums, unless, unless the exhibition is designed that people can come in and, and change the work. Which would be a trailblazing show. It would be a trailblazing no show, one's, yeah. No one's doing that, but no. that would actually be a fantastic show. Yeah, it would be. Come on, Moad. It does, it does happen. Wait, wait, in, in, intro, introduce yourself. They don't know. That's right.
square was completely white, and uh, each visitor is invited to play stops until the entire room is obliterated and becomes a sort of communal thing. But there are also infrastructures around that. And I think that's what you're sort of pointing to, George, is that every time you want to make something ex different happen, there's an infrastructure that you have to pierce yes. in order to, and then you have to make, you have to validate that, that, that piercing with your donors, with your board, with your, so all of those frameworks absolutely exist, but there are ways that we can, because it is a beautiful thing to think about it as living, but I also think that even if it never moved, it's still living, mm -hmm. right? So it's still the way that we encounter and experience the materiality of the work that shifts something within us, the thing that you place. And I would also argue that it's not metaphorical from a calmness that you're in the work, because I, my church is astrophysics, so the way that we are combining and recombining, even in this moment, in this room, we are all, in fact, residue, and the residue of these objects, it helps us to think about the, the illusion of solidity that we all, uh, that wasn't a comment, a question, that was a comment, but. No, but, but wait, wait, Kijo, do you, do you have any questions for Ramaka? I was, I was, I was, I was going to circle back to the very end. Thank you, thank you, because you you did not answer that part. What does it? What has it not done for me? Mm -hmm. I'm, uh, if if anything, because well, because because I asked it twice, right, and and you didn't answer it. So my takeaway from that was that maybe the Bay Area has not not done anything for you. Well, you know, there are, you know, there are the hope, the idea that I would, I would like the, the Bay Area in some ways to maintain the worldview that is a, a diverse, inclusive place. I'm not saying it's not, I'm only saying there's plenty of room to grow. Uh, plenty of room to grow. But, and, it, and it's difficult to, 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 to move forward on that when the area around you is becoming more and more conservative. Things are happening based on money and uh, a profit that, I could be naive about it, but it may not, may not be the, uh, the driving force decades ago. Whereas now, uh, uh, money in, in uh, large cities is, is well, maybe it's always been a primary thing. It's always been primary. Where those funds go, how they're allocated, uh, who gets them, who doesn't, is a big question for me. Like, how do I, you know, how can we, how can I be uh, be a part of a city that's that's able to push those envelopes about diversity and uh, inclusion uh, even further? Great, thank you, thank you, Kijo. Any other questions? Yes. <laughs> hey, Daniel. Oh my goodness. So wait, 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 wait. Uh, <laughs> wait, give the, uh, it's a little abstract, your question. Yeah, I mean, like when I'm, um, I'm doing work, I'm pretty involved in, sometimes I hurt myself in the process. Oh, so you're talking about physically? Physically, okay. physically okay. hurt myself. Yeah, on my, feel my shoulder, feel my back, feel my head, or, uh, or I wonder if it feels good. Um, I got I to gotta move to the edge of the, edge of the chair for this one. <laughs> Thank you for that question. Okay, so when I first started, um, 
I would wrap the ceramics with fabric so tightly over a period of time that I would uh, extend the tendons in my thumb so far that it was really painful. And I went to the doctor, um, and he said, you know, you have two options here. You can keep extending to the, to the tendon breaks, and then I'll send you to a hand specialist that works with the musicians at the, in, the, in the symphony. Or you could take a break and calm yourself and crochet for three days and rest for two or three days. So until the, the tendons in your thumb extend, you know, like, like, like if you're exercising, you know, that's why they get sore until, they, until the muscle extends and then it, it relaxes. So I was, yeah, so it, so it was, it, and when I, when I first started, yes. And then I also wasn't able, I didn't have the, the dexterity of being able to touch the ceramic so it didn't cut me. I'd have bandages, I have scars, I had, you know, so, so I worked through that. Um, and emotionally, emotionally, the most exciting thing about it is, it's an idea that's generated from me. And that is so exciting. The idea like, you know, uh, being able to say that this is something I'm doing that is fulfilling it's conceptually quite powerful. It's beautiful. It's an extension of my worldview and the world around me, and it feels good. And I don't have to worry about anything else. It's taken me 30, 40 years to get to a place where this is genuine, authentic, and it's derived from me. And uh, it, so after a while, you don't worry about the pain. And that, right now, I'm, I'm much better at it. Right now, I, I definitely can, can pick up the shard, and I know it, but sometimes I get so carried away that I still get cut, but nowhere near like I did in the beginning. So if I can just do a comprehension check on my comprehension, it's thrilling, and there is blood. Yes, that's right. <laughs> Thank you Thank for you. the insightful somatic question. Uh, any other questions? Um, so, uh, uh, as an artist and a, and a moderator, whenever I am in the audience or in Ramakan's position or in mine, I, the goal of talks like this is to give all of you greater insight into the work. And so the, the desire that I have um, in facilitating this discussion is that each of you leaves with a greater sense of the interiority of his psychology, and also that you get to view the work in the future through the prism um, that he has shared this evening. So I'm really grateful for you. I think you are just a marvelous human being thank and you. a dynamic, fantastic artist. And thank you for gracing us with your presence this evening. Thank you to Moad for being such wonderful hosts. Thank you, Salam. Thank you. thank you, Nia. Thank you, Elizabeth. Thank you, Kijo, for joining us this evening. It's a pleasure to see you. Um, and I always thank all of you. There's always a lot of other things you could be doing with your evening. And so every time someone is sitting in the audience, I always say thank you. So thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you. Thank Ram. you very much. Thank you. Thank you.